Grab your favorite caffeinated beverage and get cozy because you are listening to Mindful as a Mother with Paige Bruce and Lindsay Adams. Do you want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters. And here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. And when you want to take your conversations with your fans to the next level, you can do Q&A and polls to get them talking. With Spotify podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for podcasters, it's taken my creativity on Mindful as a Mother to a new level, and Lindsay and I have been able to reach so many people. I highly recommend you give it a try. Isn't it about time you started a podcast? Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com forward slash podcasters to get started. This podcast is not intended to be a substitute for therapy or the therapeutic relationship. And the information given in this podcast is purely for educational purposes and is not intended to replace the advice of a professional. Hello and welcome back to Mindful as a Mother. My name is Lindsay and I am here with Paige. Hey guys. Hey, and today we are doing one of our favorite things to do, a Q&A episode. And I love these because these are questions that come from our TikTok, our Instagram, and our Facebook group. And so the your real life questions, people who actually listen to this podcast. And today's questions are tough. Paige was reading them to me before. And I was like, these are hard ones. <laughs> yeah, where did you get them? I was like, don't mind me. I'm just stalking everybody on TikTok and all of their comments. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's a lot of comments to sift through. I, I have a hard time sometimes. It I get comment overwhelm with TikTok and I love it. And I love people asking us questions, but I want to help every single person. And so um, part of why I love this is we can take some common questions and we can answer them more in depth rather than like a TikTok comment, right? You know, so. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay, we're going to dive right in because our Q&As are short, sweet, and to the answer. Number one, tips on introducing structured play and craft for three-year-olds. What do you want? Oh, you want me to go first? Okay. (laughs) Um, So I think... Starting small is the best thing you could do. Something that we did with our son that was super helpful when he was three, he was not into any kind of structure play. He just wanted to do whatever he wanted to do. And he's highly spirited and, you know, just <laughs> does his own thing. he is the definition of having like an interest driven nervous system. Um, so what we did is we had a box that had crafts and toys and, you know, just different things in it. And we only played with that during like what we call it home time. Some people call it school. Some people call it whatever you want to call it, special time, golden time, whatever the hell you want to call it. Um, and it has this box and those toys are only played with during that time. And you start with like five minutes and you take the child through an adult led activity. You don't have to get all the way through or, or even starting with the adult picking the activity. And then you slowly increase the time. And this is a good way to build focus and attention and teach kids to follow adult led instructions if it's something that they struggle with. Yeah, I love it. In the question, they specifically mention if we sit down to make a craft, it's a no-go. So I just want to emphasize that at three years old, our attention span is, I would say, three minutes or less. Like, yeah, they say it's per age. Yeah. Yeah. They say it's per age. If your craft is going to take more than three minutes, it's we're going to need to break it up. We're going to need to do other things. So really, really allow yourself some grace in that area or if you're doing an activity it is age appropriate for a three-year-old to have focused attention for three minutes and then need to break and go do something else and like Lindsay said with time and practice this does extend which is helpful when we move into preschool kindergarten 
uh, but start there. Yeah, and I think just starting with the being compliant and maybe even like sitting down for the activity and then, you know, if they try to get distracted, bringing them back. So maybe the focus in the beginning isn't even the activity, but just like bringing their attention back in a playful way and using play because you don't want to use discipline or mm -hmm. um, like negative tone for this because then it creates that association with the activity. So just like, okay, we're not going to play that. We'll play that after, but we're going to come back and, oh, can you see what this does? Um, just as a way to, you know, direct them back positively. Yeah, I love it. Question number two. My daughter is six months old. I wasn't together with her father, but when he was around, he was abusive and didn't treat me very well. I worry about how it will affect her. Do you have any tips or advice for me? Do you want to go first on this one or do you want me to? So, um, so I'm thinking we're six month old and we talk about the nervous system around. I'll, around a lot and and what we want to focus on at six month old is cultivating a feeling of safety and attachment and so what was your relationship like with your six month old at this age I think that that's really important especially considering your child's father was in the picture intermittently and isn't around any longer anymore like six months up mm -hmm. yeah and so cultivating that feeling of safety and then um, in the nervous system. And it's hard at six months because there's not going to really be much verbalizing as the child gets older about how this has impacted them. They remember ab about it or don't remember their body remembers their nervous system. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a, a really great opportunity here to, um, to have a positive, association and narrative with their other parent even though maybe he was a human being who's not perfect right and mm -hmm. I'm not excusing any of the things he did but I think that really working on your nervous system regulation so that you can show up for your child is the most important thing right now and going forward and then helping them regulate their nervous system as they are getting older mm -hmm. and what this looks like at six month old and why this is so important is because at six months, we're looking at our basic needs being met, which is like food, water, safety, like predictability of food, predictability of water, predictability of that safe attachment figure meeting their needs. So like when they start to get upset or when they're dirty, we help change their diapers, like all those things. And so, yes, abuse does impact us. It does impact our nervous system. And right now, the best thing that you could do and you could focus on is one, that, that positive narrative for your child, but consistently meeting your child's needs to help their nervous system learn to attach and trust in a form of safety. Like we're, we're going to be safer because there's predictability within that relationship. Yeah. And I think that that will be a game changer, right? If you're aware of that from here on out, that will be something that will you know, it's unfortunate that this happened, but hopefully it won't be something that negatively impacts your child outside of the, the regular impact of like losing a parent so young. Yes. And I think that one thing that I haven't talked about on the podcast yet is that our nervous system and the impact of our nervous system and these, I want to say traumas, but not just this particularly, like in utero, we can experience trauma in utero. Like our nervous system is developing while we are developing as a fetus. And so we think like, as soon as they're born, that's it. That's when the trauma starts happening. But there can be things as early as like when we're developing. So the purpose of me saying that is even though this was a very impactful six months for your child, they have a nervous system history before and after. So if we think of it as like, a speed bump, it doesn't mean that the whole road is gouged out and there's no way we'll make it across, right? This is the speed bump. And as we're continuing to try to smooth out the roads moving forward. Yeah. And I think we often look at like, we want to protect our kids from all the things we want to set them up to be the most emotionally healthy 
kids that they can be, right? And when we have these bigger things happen, it can feel like a lot of pressure. And I think it's important to just remind ourselves that our kids are resilient, our nervous system is resilient, and our nervous system does need challenge to grow. And hopefully it's not trauma or um, extended bouts of stress, but it can handle some stress on it. And Mm -hmm. as long as there is like a recovery period and safety afterwards. Yeah. So that's exactly what you're doing with your six month old now, right? You're consistently meeting her needs. Um, The abuser is no longer around and you're continuing to move forward, establishing that safety and predictability for you and her, because as the parent, the way you operate in your nervous system is going to be one of the most important factors in how she grows and develops because of that modeling. Mm -hmm. All right. Question three. Are you ready? Ready. Okay, question number six. My son is dose, two years old, and it feels pretty hard to discipline him. And I feel you here. Toddlers are rough. (laughs) Um, I don't believe in spanking, and I try to take a more gentle parenting route. I don't know what to do when he doesn't listen. When I put him in timeout, he gets out multiple times, and I feel frustrated and exhausted. I want to have a conversation with him about his feelings and things like that, but he doesn't really speak full sentences yet. Do you have any tips for me? I have all the tips. Yes. Um, I all the tips. Doing, I would stop doing timeout and start doing uh, like some kind of co-regulation or calm down time together. So we can't expect, um, so two-year-olds are coming to you because they want you to soothe them because that is still the phase that they're in. And sometimes kids do genuinely need a break in space from parents, but there's a reason that your two-year-old is running to you. And um, so trying to sit with them, comfort them while Mm -hmm. validating and narrating their emotions. Um, and then once they are a little more calm, I think they can talk through the behaviors. Like if they're hitting, you want to say like, um, we use our hands for holding hands, for playing, for all these things, but we don't use them for hitting. Um, and focusing on narrating the feeling. So when your child cannot talk yet and you're wanting to teach the emotional piece, you want to narrate how you think that they feel in the moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Maybe you want to, if we're going to use clinical, professional, whatever lingo, I have like wild air quote fingers right now. Think of it, frame it in your mind as a time in. Like um, technically speaking, developmentally speaking, timeouts aren't developmentally appropriate. Like they wouldn't even do the thing a timeout is supposed to do prior to three. And even then it's like child dependent and it's like, it's a whole thing. So if you want to frame it, frame it as like a time in where it's not a punishment, Also, there's a difference in punishment and discipline. Punishment is meant to bring feelings of shame to um, help us learn not to do a behavior. Um, And discipline is teaching, right? So punishment, long-term research has shown, is not effective. Go ahead. Yeah. And uh, sorry to interrupt. My ADHD brain was just pinging over here. I've been using the term correction a lot recently because it feels like when we say discipline, people think punishment. And so I kind of even like the term correction because, or because it's just like, we're just teaching not to hit. It's just a slight correction. You know what I mean? It's not like a a huge punishment. Yeah. And I like correction. I often think of discipline, like when you're learning a career, like this is my discipline. I'm a counselor, right? Like I'm training and teaching myself. So I'm training and teaching my children. So whatever way you want to think of it, we're going to frame it that way. But ideally we we are not using punishment because even research has shown long-term, like, yes, it'll stop the behavior in a moment. If you spank a child, if you put them in timeout, if you um, decide to take away a privilege, in the moment, punishment will stop a behavior immediately, but that that isn't what gives the long-term results. The long-term results is in the correction of the discipline. And so I would frame it in your mind as a time in. Be like, and to bring my kiddo to me. Like if you find a behavior not appropriate for your family for this situation, bring them to you, interrupt the behavior, connect first. When before your child can speak. Connection is similar to validating. And if you hear us, we're always, always be validating. Okay. Always be connecting. That's what validation is. So you're going to connect with them. Um, And then 
the reason that we're seeing behaviors is because they're dysregulated, like something is going on, which is why the co-regulation piece is important. So we're just going to hang out with them, do the things they need to do until they start to feel calm and are able to act. And then we talk. But one of my very favorite things, if we are learning about emotions, are those um, like feeling posters, feeling face posters. Have you seen those? I love them. Yeah, I have them in my house, in my office. They're yeah, I have everywhere. And I can't remember the name of the company I bought mine from, but I really love it because it has like a diversity of people and abilities in their different emotions. But along with narrating their experience, you felt angry that Justin took the toy from you and you hit him. It can be really frustrating when someone takes a toy that we want to play with, right? You can also point it out on the, on the like the picture of the feelings poster of like you feel frustrated and then like exaggerated, frustrated, like, right? Like you're modeling what this is. And I think it's so fun because it can feel silly in the moment as an adult doing that. But when you see your three or four-year-old be able to verbalize and like point out their own emotions correctly based on their experience, it will blow your mind. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing more rewarding as a parent, I think, than than having your child like express what they're feeling. Same. And then I'm like, is that just because I'm a counselor or does every parent love when their four-year-old talks about how frustrated and upset they are that you told them they weren't allowed to have a popsicle? Yeah. Proud of you. <laughs> um, I don't, I, we might get a little more into it than most people, but you know. <laughs> okay. So last question. Um, my husband called our daughter a stupid brat. I felt angry and we got into an argument because I know how horrible it feels to be belittled by a loved one. I'm trying to stay positive, but this feels hard. Do you have any tips for me on how to work through this? I have a lot it's, of experience. Yeah, like yeah, this. Do you, do yeah. You go and I, yeah, so oftentimes, First disclaimer, I don't agree with any child being called a stupid brat. I don't agree with calling other humans those things, period. Especially children, because this thing, there's this thing called label theory. I don't even know what the technical name of it is, but essentially as human beings, what we are told we are, we become, or we start, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if we're continually telling our children we are something or any children that you work with or are around that they are something, they will continue to exhibit more and more characteristics of that thing. So if I'm like, you're a stupid brat, and guess what? They're going to become a stupid brat because that is what I have placed on them and they're fulfilling and living too. And that's true of all humans. But I project a lot because I had a difficult childhood. And what that means for me is if my kids are experiencing something difficult, like let's say one of the kids at my daughter's school, one of her classmates told her she had fat cheeks because when she smiles, they're like these big, beautiful cheeks that I have. Um, and so now she's fat. Okay. I have a huge response to that, not only because my daughter is hurt, but because I had an experience like that as a child. So another example that I've shared before publicly on the podcast is, um, one day my daughter was like screaming and crying and my husband was with her. And then they're both frustrated. They storm off and she comes to me screaming and crying. And she's like, dad pulled my hair and was like devastated. And she's like, adults aren't supposed to hurt children. And that's the part that stuck with me because I experienced physical punishment as a child. And so it was like, I instantly became triggered. And I was like, how dare you betray her trust? And like, I was really rough on him. And I didn't get the whole story, but that was my daughter's interpretation of it, right? Like he didn't intentionally pull her hair from what he shared. But the moral of the story was I had this big response to it because I experienced physical punishment as a child. And I wish somebody would have told me as a kid that adults aren't supposed to hurt children. Right. And that's, and that is what she was sharing with me. And then I started like my body was transformed more or less. Like I remembered and embodied the emotions related to how it felt when that happened to me. So this is a lot of what we talk about when we talk about reparenting. At every different stage of parenting in your children's development, things are going to come up because you have had experiences and your nervous system remembers them. So what I do and what I would coach you to do is allow that 
to come into your awareness and just be curious about where it come from and do the things you need to do to feel better. We're going to pause. We're going to relax, not, not relax in a traditional sense, but we're going to give ourselves a pause and acknowledge that we have this strong emotionality attached to this. And then when that starts to fade a little bit, we're going to get curious about where it came from. And I think that that is a really good first step for you in working through this. Yeah. And then I think if possible, like this gives us the space to calm down before we have the conversation with our spouse about what that's like. And I think, and and I speak from experience um, with Tim who comes from like a less traumatic childhood than me, no, maybe not a traumatic childhood. I don't, you know, I don't want to like label his experience, but so I think he doesn't always recognize the impact these things can have on a child um, because he hasn't lived my life and had my experience. And he also doesn't do my job, right? Like, I think that there's mm-hmm. this piece as well. But I found if I come at him with high emotionality, I am less likely. Um, and, and it's usually like right after the fact where I feel like he's parented in a way that I'm like not okay with or I'm triggered by for whatever reason, right? I um, It just causes conflict between us. Like the tension just boils over. And so if I can, you know, regulate myself and then have the conversation in an open, honest, and vulnerable way. Like when you said this, or when you did things this way, I am remembering these things about my childhood and how this felt to me. And also like my values are, I want to parent this way. And so it's difficult for me. And usually I've found that most people at this point recognize and apologize and like say that they've lost their temper, right? And I think that it's, it's a, can be like a good lesson for everybody if you can regulate yourself first. I agree. Being able to really pause before we respond and have those conversations is going to help us have more supportive conversations and productive conversations with the people in our lives that are partnering in our parenting. Um, but I still encourage you to have that conversation and to share what it was like for you and that you aren't, you don't want your child to feel those things, which is why you are so passionate about this particular thing. Yeah. And I think the more we are open about those things and, and being a parent, I think any parent can relate to this trigger something in you, right? Like Mm -hmm. you do things you never thought you would do. You get triggered in ways you never thought you were triggered. And so I'd be curious, curious even like what led to your husband feeling triggered enough to call her that right like and he probably is aware of that and working through that and so I think it's just a good like lesson and opportunity when you're in the space to have that conversation yeah it's a great opportunity and then you're both reparenting yourselves to hopefully show up differently next time Mm -hmm. That is all of our questions today. Thank you guys so much for continually commenting. These came from our TikTok, Instagram, and our Facebook group. Um, If you have questions, you can get us on any of those platforms, or you can email them to mindfulasamotherpod at gmail.com. I know y'all listened to the podcast sprint a couple weeks ago. So again, if you're interested in more of learning about reparenting yourself, inner child work, nervous system work, that's what we're talking about. Go back, listen to the podcast sprint, and check out the low cost cheat sheets in our store. They're going to help you learn more about your nervous system and to really understand how you respond. Yeah. yeah. See you guys next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks for coming to mindful as a mother podcast. If you'd like more of us and mindful as a mother, you can find Paige at Instagram at parenting with Paige and Lindsay at Linz underscore Adams LCSW. Find us on TikTok, Instagram, and in our Facebook group, creating community and smashing parental stigma, embracing mindful motherhood and positive parenting. Thanks so much and see you next time.